So let's continue from the from another type of uh, solid representations. Uh, this is mesh representation. And as the name implies, we are using meshes to represent the boundaries. And again, in this one, the interior is represented implicitly. We are assuming that we have a uh, solid interior. So our main focus will be the outer boundary and it will be represented with planar polygons. For most of the time, we prefer to use triangles, but there are also some, uh, let's say, software using quadrangles, hexagons. It's up to, again, the type of application you are working on. Sometimes quadrangles might be easier, better, or sometimes the triangles might be better for your kids. And we need to obviously make use of in this type of representation, the edges, vertices, normals, spaces. But for most of the time, the most useful thing in the mesh representation are the vertices. Since by making use of these vertices, you can define the triangles and other kind of polygons easily. If you have a kind of, let's say, counterclockwise orient uh, order, and then maybe you may not need to have normals, but in some cases, in order to be on the safe side, in order to represent the outer of this shape properly, uh, such file systems prefer to have uh, normals in their uh, representations. And as I mentioned, triangles are the most popular ones. Obviously, in the triangle surface representations, all the polygons are triangle. And we have an example for that, the STL file format, one of the popular file formats in 3D printing. Uh, we are using such triangles to represent the models. And uh, obviously, uh, once you do the HL meshing, sometimes you may lose information about the geometry, especially if you have some curved or conformed surfaces. Since uh, we are restricted, restricted by the planar polygons, planar faces. With these, you cannot represent such complicated features. So that's why we have a problem uh, in terms of geometrical accuracy. It will decrease if you have especially formed surface. But if it's a planar surface, if your design is just composed of planar faces, then there is no error. You can exactly represent the designed model. And sometimes we may need to have uh, vertex identifiers in these file formats, uh, the first vertex, the second one, for instance, in order to make it make things simpler while defining the faces. And this is especially used in the object file format. As you know, you utilize this uh, property in your first mini project. The vertices had implicit identifiers and you did use these identifiers to represent the faces. And considering the faces, sometimes if you don't have information, it might be quite difficult to understand which side of the face is the interior and which side is outside of the model. So we can do it by using a right hand rule for most of the time or we may have an extra normal, like in the case of STL files, but in the object file, we make use of the right-hand rule. We don't have a normal. In some different versions of object file, they also use a uh, normal spot, it's not a must. If you properly make use of the right-hand rule, then you don't need to add a normal to each set, each face. So as I mentioned in STL files, we make use of simply uh, the triangles and the normals. Here you see, for instance, we have a simple cube. Obviously this cube has uh, eight vertices. And then on the right-hand side, you see the STL file content. This is an ASCII format of STL file we make use of such uh, normals, uh, such, let's say, letters, numbers. You can easily understand what is going on in the file, but in the binary version, in the binary type of STL files, you will not be able to read the content. So what we do in the STL file, we do 
some triangulation. The surfaces are triangulated. So for each surface, each face of the uh, cube is divided into two triangles, okay? We have another one here. So it makes 12 triangles, right? We have six faces. If one face is represented with two triangles, then we need to have 12 triangles. And as you see, there are 12 triangles represented. How do we, how we do the representation of a single, let's say, face or a single triangle? This is actually, we define the normal. Uh, we need to use unit normal vectors. And now we simply define the loop and we usually prefer to use, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the right hand rule. So we have a uh, counterclockwise orientation. This is the first vertex, the second and the third. These three vertices are defining, uh, a, let's say, uh, a triangle. So this is the origin. Let's try to find that triangle. This is zero, zero, zero. What are other values? Two, zero, zero. So then that is probably two, zero, zero. This is, by the way, we see x, y, and we have an z axis here. The last one is x is two, y is zero, and z is two. So then that means we have such a triangle here. Initially, I have done the triangulation in a different manner, but this is actually the triangle right now we are working on. So that's why it's normal is zero minus one and zero, which means that it has a normal vector in the minus y direction. This is how we represent the triangle. And if you do it for all the triangles, then you will be done with this STL file or the triangulation of this simple cube having dimensions of two. Any questions, guys, regarding uh, the triangulation, regarding this mesh representation or the STL files? Okay. The axis location and direction are the same for all. I don't see the rest for all the STL file. Yes, the origin is always at the leftmost, left bottommost corner of the object. So we prefer to use this corner as the origin of the object for most of the time in STL files. Uh, this is a kind of a rule. The origin is always at the left bottommost corner. And the directions uh, are always the same. This is our uh, coordinate system, X, Y, and Z. Other questions, guys? Okay. So if you remember, this was the fourth type of representation, special subdivision representation. And I said that we may have, an, have the same, let's say, subdivision for throughout the object, or we may have different, a larger division and a smaller division. It's again up to your uh, application. In this first example, we see a kind of a voxelized subdivision. The voxels are kind of actually uh, 2D version, 3D versions of pixels in images, as you know. We have such pixels. These are called pixel in 2D. And in 3D, we have the voxels. And once you represent your model by using voxels, then we can say that this model is voxelized. And as you see here, it's a regular subdivision. They all have the same dimension, same unit dimension. And then we have an oak tree representation. This is another uh, representation type, but not that complicated. 
recursively do the subdivision and we recursively divide the cube into eight sub cuboids. As you see here, this, the larger one is the bigger cube. And then we divide it into eight small portions. And these are the cube, sub cuboids. So this is it actually, one of them here. But the thing is that we don't need to uh, make use of these sub cuboids throughout the model. For instance, at the center of this model, this complicated shape, we may have larger ones. But once we approach to the boundaries, we may make use of such sub cuboids. So we always use cubes, but larger cubes at the center and smaller ones at the outer boundary of the shape. So this is the main difference of the representation with respect to the voxelized subdivision. This is called octree representation or octree uh, subdivision. And then we have another version. This is called binary space partition. And the thing is that this time we don't have uh, regular sizes. We have irregular sizes. And the thing is that we are always dividing the larger shape by half. By using half planes, we are dividing it into smaller parts. But as you see, we have here smaller kind of cubes or boxes, but on the neighbor of these boxes, we have a longer, let's say, box. And that's why this is an irregular representation. And again, it's recursive. At the center, like in the case of octree, at the center of, of your shape, you may have larger boxes, but when you approach the boundaries, you should, it's better you decrease the size of your boxes to make uh, your representation as accurate as possible. And this is actually how we do subdivision, let's say in 2D. Initially, you may have such a rectangle. You may divide it into two, another division, another, another. So this is how we do the subdivision in the binary space partition methods. And you can make use of a kind of a tree while representing these. So as implicitly or explicitly written here, we need to use a tree like, like data structures to store uh, information about this modeling. Any questions, guys, about uh, these three different types of special subdivision? Obviously, once you do such subdivisions, we are dividing the initial shape into some smaller cells. And the thing is that we are trying to use simple structures, simple topological structures to represent such complicated work pieces, complicated designs. If you remember the previous image, we have a kind of a figure. It, is, well, it was highly complicated, but we did represent it by simply using cubes or simple boxes. So it's a nice way to represent such models. Another issue is that uh, sometimes, let's say this is a side view of the figure, you may have such curvy surfaces. But once you use a uh, regular cube there, then we will have this amount of error in their uh, representation. So instead, what we do sometimes, we may use conforming, let's say, items, elements, or sometimes boundary approximating. So this part is a boundary approximating. Since it's an approximation, we have error. But if you use such a shape, then that will be a conforming, boundary conforming, let's say, item element in your subdivision. But the problem about the conforming ones is that you need to spend more time, do more computation on obtaining such, uh, let's say, items at the boundary. So it will cost you a lot, but the advantage is that it will be highly accurate compared to your 
cases where you just use simple cubes or regular cubes. So the advantage is the accuracy, but the disadvantage is the computational time and the memory. You need to store more information about these faces. So the size of your file will be larger than the case where you simply use cubes or subcuboids. And this is the advantage of the approximation. The size of your file will be less, but the disadvantage is that you will be doing approximation and you will have geometrical errors. So that's why it's an approximation, not an conforming boundary representation, it's an approximating boundary representation. And what we do, as I mentioned that in the previous slide, how we store these values, we make use of usually trees, bond, uh, bond, uh, space, binary space partition trees. We may use them for finite elements, finite element meshes. They may be represented at the leaves of these trees. And obviously, if you are using finite elements, then that means it will be a kind of an approximation or sometimes you may have special elements, but the thing is that you need to store some information about these special elements. And you know that in meshes, we may use uh, different types of polyhedra. They might be tetrahedron, hexahedron, or simple polyhedron. Any other questions, guys? Now we will jump to a bit different topic. Uh, it's again a kind of a uh, representation method, but not as uh, not very similar to the previous one. The four we actually covered in the first and in the second lecture. This is called as medial surface representations. So in this representation, we have a medial axis at the center, and you need to also give some extra information to this medial axis so that with the help of the axis and uh, other extra information, you can represent these surfaces. It can be used for on two dimensional things, surfaces, but these days we also make use of it in 3D solids. And not frequently used these days, but people are trying to find some ways uh, to use such medial surface representations in the geometric problems. And this is very frequently used for uh, shape recognition. Since it's like a skeleton, I will show you an example. Yes. If you look at this medial surface representation, these are the medial axis, the lines at the center. So you can assume that these are kind of skeletons of the given shapes. The skeleton, and if you look at this maple leaf here, so it's like uh, their veins, or we can say that it's kind of a skeleton. And that's why in computer graphics, some people are trying to use it for oops, shape recognition. So it's kind of like having the skeleton of a people. So these are the skeleton. You may assume that this is the medial axis in 3D. And once you use it in your in live videos, you can easily determine the shape of people and try to do some research, try to have some other information from these uh, skeletons or medial axis. And we also have some uh, different types of meshing algorithms which depend on the medial axis. They start with the medial axis or after their meshing, they obtain the uh, medial axis. This is uh, done in both ways. And we will see in uh, Voronoi diagrams that we may make use of them to obtain the medial axis. So here is the example and I would like to discuss how we obtain uh, such, let's say, medial axis. What do we do? This is our shape, the given shape. And as you see, we have such a skeleton or such a medial axis. So what we do, how do we obtain this medial axis? We make use of some 
maximum inscribed circles. So what is that? And their centers will be contributing to the medial axis. The centers of these uh, circles will be contributing to the medial axis. So how I do it? Uh, you try to embed a kind of a circle, the largest circle, which is touching two faces of the given shape. So this is actually, as you see, one of them here. So the center is around here. And if you move it little, then the center will be here, here. At this point, as you see, we have the largest circle possible. And then it should, as I mentioned, touch at least two faces of your shape. And right now at this corner is touching one point here, two and three points. But this minimum number is two. We may move it more in this uh, direction. And as you see now, it's touching just two points, not three. And at this point here, if you try to use the same uh, size of circle, you realize that at this point, you cannot go further. This is the largest circle we can fit into this, let's say bottom of the shape. This has an uh, intersection of three vertices with the initial shape, one, two, and the third one is at the bottom. So you may sometimes uh, conclude that this is just the medial axis of your shape. You may stop at this point, but if you want to have an, a detailed, let's say medial axis, then you may continue it smaller, let's say uh, inscribed circles. So what we do then, we try to decrease the size of the circle and maybe have some other branches like this one here. So if I draw a circle here, let me clear it and try to draw a new one here. To obtain the center, I need to have a kind of an, say circle here. As you see, while we are going into that corner, we need to decrease the size of the circle so that we will always have contact with the faces. At least two contact with the faces. And you can also do the same on the right hand side and do it also for this corner or other corners. So the main thing is that you need to decrease the size of your circle and it should again be touching to two faces, at least two faces of the initial outer boundary. And with this way, we can obtain detailed, let's say, medial axis instead of just a single one. So you may assume that this is a thicker one, but the other ones uh, are thinner. So this might be the thinner one. So the thing is that once you give uh, this information to user just the medial uh, access, then by using it, uh, they can actually obtain the boundary, maybe not exactly, but maybe about 95, uh, with 95 percent accuracy, they can obtain uh, the initial boundary. The only problem they may have might be at the corners or maybe at this uh, specific point, but for most of the time, for about 95% of the time, you can easily obtain the outer boundary by simply using the medial axis. Any questions, guys, about this uh, type of representation? You can ask something. Sure, Mita. Uh, for this example, uh, we were given by the outside lines and the inside skeleton lines, right? With, uh, without the circles. What do you mean? Uh, for the drawing, do you mean? For yeah. drawing for medial axis? Yes. Then the problem will be like this.
So given this, uh, given this medial axis, draw the boundary of the shape. That will be the question. Any questions, guys? Okay, these are some other examples I already shown you. If you look at here, for instance, again, we have inscribed circles, maximal inscribed circles. So they are touching the outer boundary from two points. And as we go forward, the size of the circle is increased. But if you want to touch the, let's say, the outer, the topmost region of the boundary, then you need to decrease the size of your uh, circle. And we do the same for all the detailed interior features, like the bottom here. And as you see, this branch has a shorter length, but the other one is a longer length. The case, the reason is that if we have a shape going towards the right more, and at the center, as you see, we have a larger circle, which means that we can have kind of a uh, connection of the branches. And this is also the same here. Usually we have a kind of a uh, junction point at the largest circle, at the center of the largest circle. And let me switch to a different color and make it blue. Okay, if you look at here, we have such circles. And for the center, I need to have a very large inscribed circle, maximal inscribed circle. Okay, it should actually be touching if it's uh, from at least three points. Otherwise, we cannot represent a circle. 